posting our event this morning. Thank you for joining us and tuning into this format where we continue to bring authors and new books to you. I'm pleased to welcome our guest today, Don Tate. You can buy your copy of Don's new book, William Still and His Freedom Stories, The Father of the Underground Railroad by clicking on the link in our chat box. Signed book plates and a poster will be included with every purchase of William Still and His Freedom Stories while supplies last. If you have a question for Don, you, a family member, or your teacher can click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and add one there. At the bottom, at the end of the chat, Don will have time to answer some of your questions. You can also vote on questions you like and you want most answered. We do ask that questions are related to the book and author or topics brought up during the event. As always, thank you for your kindness and positive engagement while joining us today. Now on to the event you're waiting for. Don Tate is the award-winning illustrator of numerous books for children, including Carter Reads the Newspaper. He is the author and illustrator of Poet, the Remarkable Story of George Moses Horton, for which he won the Ezra Jack Keats New Writer Award. He is also the co-contributor to The Brown Bookshelf, a blog designed to raise awareness of African-Americans writing for young readers. He currently lives in Austin, Texas with, the, Austin, Texas with his family. I now turn the event over to Don. All right, all right, good morning, everyone. Um, it is such an honor to be with you all today and thank you for being here. I wish that we all could be together in person. I am missing actually being able to see my audience and to touch the students and to and connect with them in that way. But thank you, Politics and Prose, for making it possible for me to celebrate my new book with you virtually. Um, this is the special week. Uh, my new book, um, William Steele and His Freedom Stories, Father of the Underground Railroad actually published this week after, I don't know, four or five years of writing and revising and preparing for this week. So um, it is so exciting when a book finally publishes. I have a special PowerPoint presentation prepared and I'm going to share my screen. I'm gonna see for a second, you're gonna see my very messy desktop for a second and then you'll see see my keynote share okay and play all right so these are some of the um i say 80 books so i'm an author and an illustrator and i've illustrated written and or illustrated um, more than 80 trade and educational books for kids and so these are some of my book covers thank you politics and prose for hosting this event um, I love independent bookstores. You all make it possible for me to get my books out into the world and I wouldn't be able to do what I do if it wasn't for the independent bookstores like yourselves. This is a picture of me with the beloved Eloise Greenfield. Um, and this was my very first experience at Politics and Prose. And I guess this was probably maybe, I don't know, four or five years ago. I made a, a research trip to um, Philadelphia to do some research on the William Steele book. And then I went to DC and I went to politics and prose and, and I had lunch there for those of you who don't know, it's not just a bookshop, but there's a full restaurant or at least there was back then a full restaurant. And so this picture has a lot of meaning for me because Eloise Greenfield and I actually went on to, I don't have the book behind me. We went on to collaborate on a book called Parte Dance the Dancing Vegetables. I don't know. I do so many books now trying to remember all the titles, but it's a book about a dancing um, head of cabbage. And these are my two new books. Both of these books published within two weeks. And if there's one thing that I've learned through this experience is don't publish two books in two weeks because I'm going bonkers here. I want to talk about the inspiration behind my William Steele book. Um, so my mom sent me, because I have one of those moms who's a, she, a huge supporter, and she's always giving me ideas um, about stories that I might write or sending me things in the mail. So one day she sent me this biographical dictionary of Black Americans. And I was like, Mom, okay, you know, thank you, but what am I going to do with all this stuff? Um, one day during Black History Month, I got the idea to kind of go through the book and start sketching some of the figures inside. And that also inspired me to go out onto the internet and look up other African-American figures and just sketch one person per day and make them as a free download on my website. Then one day I came across that image of William Still and I stopped sketching 
and I started writing. So who was William Still? He was known as the father of the Underground Railroad at the time of his death. The New York Times eulogized him as the father of the Underground Railroad. He was also a civil rights activist. Um, after slavery ended, um, black people in Philadelphia weren't allowed to ride in the streetcars, in the streetcars, and William still protested and he won it and made it possible for black people to ride in the streetcars. And he also was a very successful businessman. So this is the cover and I'm going to do a short reading and kind of, well actually not so, not so short reading, kind of a, an overview of the story. This story begins at a time when the United States was split in two. In the North, black people were free. In the South, they were enslaved by whites. Slavery was a nightmare, backbreaking work under a scorching sun, threats of lashing or worse, there was no pay. Children were separated from their mamas and papas, brothers and sisters, sold away at auction, never to be seen again. Sometime during the 1700s, Levin and Sidney Steele were held captive on a Maryland farm, forced to work. Their four children were two. The family yearned to live free. I will die before I submit to the yoke, Levin told the man who enslaved him. The two came to an agreement. Levin was allowed to work over hours, actually receiving a small income. With the money he earned, Levin purchased his freedom. But freedom wasn't always fair, especially to black people. Could a black man, could a free black man remain in the South? Levin must have wondered, might he be enslaved again? There was no chancing that. Levin bid his family goodbye with the plan to return to rescue them later. In a blink, he bolted north. Now, Sydney wasn't so fortunate. There was no opportunity for her or the children to purchase her freedom. They remained behind, still enslaved, a separation she could not endure. Torn and tormented, she whispered a parting prayer for her two boys who were big and strong enough to fend for themselves. Then she escaped with her two girls. Sydney reunited with her husband in the pine woods near Washington Township, New Jersey. Now they were together free as the wind. They changed their last name from Steel to Steel to throw slave catchers off. Their new life was good, but living ate like an open sore. Levin and Sidney longed for the two sons they had left behind. Over the years, the family grew. Now there were 15 children, 15 mouths to feed. Oh, how they struggled. Money was tight, food was scarce, shoes, if there were any, were hand-me-down. In 1821, the youngest child was born. Sunlit eyes, mahogany skin, they named him William. He grew quick as a weed. Eight years later, a neighbor was attacked late one night. The man, was once, the man had once been enslaved in the South. He had escaped and found peace in the pines. Slave catchers, they tracked the man down. They rushed at him, cuffed his arms, and they beat him badly. Thankfully, the man escaped again, but he needed help. And soon, the greedy men were still on the prowl. The neighbors, they called on William. The young boy knew every nick and cranny of those woods. William led the man to safety, some 20 miles away. The experience defined the rest of his life. So began his journey, a lifetime of helping people, helping freedom seekers escape north on the Underground Railroad system. Not many people know that the Underground Railroad system did not exist in the South. So enslaved people were pretty much on their own to escape and find their way north. Once in the North, then they could get help on the Underground Railroad system. Helping to reunite families torn apart by slavery and helping to rescue freedom seekers from cruel slave holders. 
And one of the things that I learned when writing this book was the importance of using um, sensitive terminology. You see, had I wrote this book maybe, oh, I don't know, uh, 10 years ago, um, I might have described those enslaved people as fugitives. I might have described them as runaways, but a more humanizing term to use, they were freedom seekers. They were human beings who were seeking freedom. They were not slaves. They were human beings who were enslaved by white people. And the people who owned them, they were not masters. That is a dehumanizing word to use. They were not their masters. They were enslavers. They held these people captive. Now at that time, freedom seeking people were drawn to Philadelphia like a magnet. It was the nearest free city to the slave holding South. They arrived daily by the dozens, passengers on a secret network called the Underground Railroad. Now, as these freedom seekers passed through Philadelphia, William, who was now working as an, who was now working at the Anti-Slavery Society office, he also opened his home as a station on the Underground Railroad. These passengers who arrived in Philadelphia, they were tired, they were sick and hungry. They were cut up and broken, marred and maimed, frantic and fearful and fed up, but they were hopeful. Now, as they passed through his home, what William would do is he would keep records of these people because he had, it was his hope that he could help reunite these families torn apart by slavery. So he recorded their names and their ages, whether it was a boy or a girl, a man or a woman, the hue of their skin, copper, chestnut, dark brown. And is equally as important as those records that he kept, he also recorded their stories, their personal stories. Um, we know the story of Henry Box Brown. You all maybe have read a book about Henry Box Brown. Well, the reason that today we know that story is that William still recorded it. We know that Harriet Tubman passed through William's line of the Underground Railroad several times because William still documented her arrival. And we know the story of William and Ellen Craft, an enslaved couple who escaped from the South in disguise. They stayed in the best hotels. They rode on trains. They rode on steamships with steamship captains, all in disguise. Light-skinned Ellen passed as a white man and William pretended to be her slave. Now, at that time, um, William Steele's work became dangerous for him because the Fugitive Slave Act was passed. The Fugitive Slave Act required citizens, everyday citizens, it became the law that you assist in the capture of freedom seekers and helped return them to their enslavers. And if you didn't, you could go to jail. Well, this law encouraged the kidnapping of freedom seekers, but they also encouraged the kidnapping of free black people. Nowhere in the South or the North at that time could a black man live and be safe. So William Steele's records and those, those records that he kept, they put him at great danger but he had a plan, he didn't give up. He hid though, he bundled his records and all those stories and placed them where no one would think to look, in the back of a cemetery, inside a dark vault, among the rats and the dead. These laws were meant to shut down the Underground Railroad, but shut down they did not. In Pennsylvania and New York, Michigan and Vermont, Black people, black neighborhoods, black churches drove the Underground Railroad full steam north, carrying freedom seeking people straight into Canada. At that time, Canada was known as Freedom Land. And then in 1872, William Steele published all of those stories and the records that he kept into a book that he called The Underground Railroad. 
Williams' records and the stories he, reserved, he preserved reunited families that were torn apart by slavery because that's what stories can do. Protest injustice, sue, teach, inspire, and connect. I truly believe that stories can save lives. Um, and so one of the cool things about telling the story was the research process. And earlier this year, my publisher, Peachtree, and my wonderful editor and my, and my, and my, um, my promotion team made arrangements for me to visit the Philadelphia Historical Society. And they actually had a copy of one of, of William Steele's journal, Journal C. This is the journal that he hid in that cemetery vault. And inside the journal, I found a diary entry from the night that Harriet Tubman passed through his line of the Underground Railroad. And me and my editor, we knew that that journal entry had to become the image that we would use on the end papers of the book. So this is the end paper. And if you look up there in the top right-hand corner, you can see that Harriet Tubman passed through in December, on December 29th, of 1854 and she arrived with with six other passengers or six other freedom seekers and these are their names so i'm really excited about that book but guess what i have two books that are publishing inside of two weeks and so i want to quickly talk about my next book which is called swish the Slam Dunking, Alley Ooping, High Flying Harlem Globetrotters, written by my buddy Suzanne Slade um, and publishes with Little Brown. And these are the original Harlem Globetrotters. See, I thought the Harlem Globetrotters started like in the 70s when I would go and watch them play, but they actually started way earlier than that in the 1920s. It all started with those boys thump, thump, thumping basketballs up and down Chicago South Side in alleyways, driveways, and parking lots. Raw talent and determination and worn out sneakers, practicing nonstop layups, all net free throws, and high sky jump shots. Oops, my images are apparently out of order here. When their team charged into Wendell Phillips High wearing those official school jerseys, every student grew an inch taller with pride. Their players were unstoppable. Division champs. Everyone could see they had so much talent as the country's best hoopsters. But the top teams only recruited white players. So after graduation, those Wendell Phillips stars joined traveling teams for black players only. Before long, a few players met a small man with a big dream, Abe Saperstein, who helped them form their own team, the Harlem Globetrotters. The name sounded grand, like they had played all over the world. Not quite, they, but they barnstormed their way across America. Little Abe and his five giant players, Toots Wright, Kid Oliver, Fat Long, Runt Pullins and Andy Washington. They squeezed into an old Model T and chugged from town to town searching for anyone who would play. Farmers, students, lumberjacks, and people who would watch, who would actually pay to watch them play. Seven nights a week, the, the road weary team played ball, whether they were healthy or sick or injured and they won nearly every game. But guess what? Hometown fans didn't like these out of town hotshots skunking their team. Soon the Trotters came up with a plan, however. Smack in the middle of the game, each player performed a handballing trick while other players took a short rest. Crowds howled with delight at the surprising sights. One finger ball spinning, rapid fire mini dribbling and a ricochet headshot. Suddenly people didn't mind when the hilarious trotters beat their team. And I ended the story because the globe trotters were known as the global ambassadors. The globe trotters are for everyone. 
And so I ended the story with this picture, um, my rendition of the Harlem Globetrotters and all of the, pe the various people all over the world, the various children, I should say, who they inspired. Children like me who, when I was a kid, I would go watch the Harlem Globetrotters play and I would go home and try to spin that ball on my finger, but I wasn't a sports kid, so I could never dribble or spin a basketball. Now, I'm going to experiment with trying to draw a Harlem Globetrotter. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. And now I'm going to reshare my screen, but I'm going to show you my very messy desktop. For a second, you're gonna see my messy desktop. Share screen. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Share screen. And how come it's not sharing my screen here? So what you, sh let me start over here. This is not working. So I'm going to, Select my desktop and share my screen. Believe it or not, this worked while we were practicing earlier this morning. Maybe I need to... Okay. If there is a way from your end to get us out of here, because my screen Computers. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Stop. I have two computers, two screens here. Don, it looks like it's up now. Stop share and share screen and. Okay. So, do you? What are you? What are you seeing? Are you I seeing my desktop? We're seeing your desktop. Yes. Okay. Great. That's what you should be seeing. So now I'm going to cover up my very des messy desktop. So the only thing that you will see is my drawing program. And you can't see it from where you're sitting, but I draw at a large Cintiq. It's like a great big iPad that I can draw my pictures on. And you can see that I have my reference drawing. I always use um, drawing reference so that, cause I don't know what a Globetrotter looks like in, in my head. So I use reference to double check to be sure that my drawing looks like a globe trotter, And I create my drawings with basic shapes. And I encourage you students to do the same thing. So here's a basic shape of the body. This particular globe trotter has really big shoulders. So I have two large circles for his big shoulders. That will represent his neck. He has long wiry arms. And again, I'm just using basic shapes at this point. Cylinder and another cylinder. I'm going to move my reference out of the way for a second. Now I'm drawing this very fast and it's a cartoon. So this is not going to look exactly like this person. And that's okay. As artists, we have to give ourselves permission to draw a picture that's not so well and to write stories that aren't written so well, because then we go back and we revise those stories and we re re rewrite them and we redraw them. And each with each revision, our drawings get a little bit better or our writing gets a little bit better. So now I just have some basic shapes and now I'm going to connect the shapes. So I'm going to give him some traps I'm going to give him kind of pointy elbows. And I'm going to put in some basic lines for the basketball. And you'll also notice that I'm drawing with a blue pencil. And that's called a photo, a non-photo blue pencil. This is my underdrawing. My underdrawing is never, ever perfect. But what I'll be able to do eventually is to take this underdrawing. And I think I'm going to stop there. This is my practice drawing, my underdrawing. And now I'm going to make this drawing much lighter. You can kind of see it getting very light. So I draw on layers. Think of this as my drawing is on a bottom layer. This is my blue layer. And now I'm going to add a layer over top of that, a clear layer that I'm going to draw on top of. And you can kind of see my palette here. These are all of the 
digital painting tools that I can use. I'm going to find, let me see, Frendon's Digital Inker. That's a brush that I don't really like too much. There. Okay. I don't really like that brush too much. I'm gonna choose a different brush. How about that one? And I don't like that one either. How about this one? Okay, that's not a bad brush to use, but it's the wrong size. So I'm gonna go down here in my palette and choose a different size. And I kind of like this brush. I kind of like that size. So now I can go into my drawing and add some details. Again, this is just going to be a cartoon. So it's not going to be something that has a whole lot of detail in it. And remember that my, my tablet that I'm using is pressure sensitive, which means that in some places, my lines are gonna be thicker. In other places, my lines are gonna be thinner. But it's just like drawing on real paper. But if I mess up, let's say that, oh, I've messed up his hair. That's not the way his hair looks. I can simply click a button and undo, and then I can go back in and add more details. Now I'm going to go in and add the details of his, of his body. He has kind of big muscles there. And again, because I'm drawing very fast, this is not going to be a perfect picture, but that's okay. If I were doing this for the actual Globetrotter book, I would step back and say, this is not quite working out the way I wanted it to, so I'd start all over again. Sometimes when I draw my books, I have to draw those pictures three and four, five, six times, sometimes maybe even 30 times before I even get to this point of adding in the ink. So I'm gonna finish off of this line work, try to speed it up a little bit here. I'm not gonna do any color today. I'm just gonna do a black and white line drawing. But remember that this drawing program would allow me to go in and paint this picture using oil paints or watercolors or pastels or chalk, any kind of natural media that you can imagine. So this is my basic um, messy drawing, and then I can go in and I can, I can delete that under drawing. And now if I wanted to, I could go back in here and I could add more details. I could just keep adding just as much. And then if I wanted to, I don't really have time to do that this morning, but if I wanted to add color, I could add a new layer, move that layer underneath my black layer, choose a skin color, choose a brush, I mean, maybe I'll choose this inker brush, a big inker brush at a smaller size. And now I can go in and I can add color. And I could just spend all day adding the color to this drawing. Now, I'm not gonna do that now. I'm just gonna use this pen to sign my name. I have a big sloppy signature, so I always write my name underneath my signature so you'll know who the artist is. So that is a very quick drawing demonstration. And now I'm going to go to questions, which means I need to stop sharing my screen. Let's see if I can get this to work. Stop sharing and go back to, let me see, what are, are you, are you all seeing just me now? Just you. Okay, great, all right. <laughs> that yeah. worked almost perfectly. Yeah, no, that was awesome. I love seeing how that works. That is so fascinating. Thank you for giving us that demonstration. That was oh, amazing. Oh, certainly. Yeah. Love fun. Awesome. All right, let's get to some questions here. Um, the first question is from Andrea Siegler, or Seeger, sorry. Um, she asks, is it possible for you to describe the emotions and feelings that you had when you leafed through William Still's logbook? Oh, that was such an awesome moment because I had already read those diary entries in his printed book and experienced a lot of emotion reading those stories at that time. But to actually hold the same journal in my hands that William Steele held and that he that he wrote in and that he, you know, you know, hid those stories in that cemetery um, vault, it was a very emotional moment. Now I'm not an emotional person, so I didn't sit there and cry in front of my editor, but uh, it was quite the emotional moment. You know, it's like history, um, 
you know, history coming to life right there in my hands. Yeah. Um, could you, um, before we went on, we were talking a little bit about that book. Could you talk a little bit about what that book looks like? The, well, now which book? Oh, the, the one that you're talking about, um, one of the published diver diversions, what the, yes. the log turns into, the yes. green book that you So one of the out. interesting things, and before I talk about it, I will back up. One of the things that you'll notice about the end papers, and now this is, you know, from his actual diary, and you'll see a line going through, um, th through his entries. And we asked the docents at the Historical Society, what, what was this line all about? And they said that as he transcribed the, his notes into the book, then he would mark the page off uh -huh. so that he would know where he was in the transcription process. Okay. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, so then I visited the Free Library of Philadelphia a few years ago. And the librarians there made it possible for me to hold one of the early editions of the printed book. And it is probably the most beautiful book that I've ever seen. I didn't even realize at the time there was this kind of technology back then, but the book was embossed. Um, it was like an emerald green book with, and it was like leather, leather embossed with gold um, foil stamping. Um, and it was, yeah, like I said, the most beautiful book that I've ever seen. Wow. Um, and it was such an honor. I was actually able to hold that book in my hands as well. Mm, amazing, amazing. Okay, let's take some more questions. This is from Steve Shankin. Were you able to find out much about William Still's wife, Letitia? She, uh, he mentions her in his book a few times, but wish he told more about her. I know, I and mean, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you, it's kind of an editorial decision. Now in my early drafts, Letitia was in there. She was a dressmaker and I actually found some advertising where she had advertised her dressmaking business. And I mean, in addition, there were a couple of kids in the story as well. And he married Letitia at this, around the same time that he started working at the Anti-Slavery Society office. And so, yeah, I thought that was an important thing to include in the story, but we, and you've heard the, the expression to kill your darlings. Um, this is a story of William Steele's life. It's the story of the Underground Railroad. It's the story of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. It's the story of his parents who were enslaved a generation before and those four kids. And so we kind of had to make the decision, is the story getting weighted down a bit too much and where can we cut back? And so that was one of the details that we made the, the decision to cut back on. And, and unfortunately, that is a decision that we, I don't know if it's a bad one or good one or not, but in all of the books that I've written, we've had made the choice to not include the family members. Um, Eugene Sandow, um, is a, a Victorian bodybuilder. He was married. We chose not to talk about his wife because after he died, she, she burned all of his belongings. Oh. <laughs> he was a philanderer, what do you call a, um, a philanderer. Yeah. Uh, so she wasn't real happy with him. Um, the same with George Moses Horton. Um, he was uh, an enslaved poet. Um, and he was married and we chose not to include the story of his wife and, and his family because they lived on separate plantations and their story didn't really fit well into the, the entire arc of, of the book, so. Right, hard decisions to make. Yeah, tough yeah. decisions to make. Yeah, uh, this is a similar uh, question in a similar vein. Um, Katie is asking, can you tell us more about what happened to William and Ellen Craft and their family? Oh, I couldn't tell you that. <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know, I didn't, uh, I, I read the, um, entry a while ago, but I didn't do much follow up on what happened to them after that. Yeah, I'm sorry about another that. book. <laughs> yeah, another book for another yeah, day. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, let's see. We have a, qu a question from Elise Vincenti. Um, the question is: A lot of your work focuses on history and nonfiction. What is your favorite part about writing, working on history and nonfiction books for children, and what is the most challenging part? So yeah, I love telling these stories of little known African American heroes. And I think that their stories are important. I think that children need to know these stories so that they can better understand, especially black children, so that they can better understand our um, history in this country and beyond. Um, when I was a kid, there wasn't a whole lot of black history in you know, taught in schools and oftentimes it was about slavery. So when I got into publishing, I was kind of ashamed of the topic of slavery. I didn't want to write stories about um, slavery. Mm -hmm. um, but then as I started to read some slave narratives and I started to study the topic myself, I realized that these are stories of black resilience 
and what we can do in the face of the biggest adversities. And so I think that these are stories that kids do need in, in the school so that they can better understand because, you know, history doesn't, I often tell kids, if you want to better understand what is happening in your world today and how you might navigate your world moving into tomorrow, mm -hmm. you can study about what happened yesterday because history keeps repeating and trying to repeat itself. We're kind of experiencing that today with what's going on in our, in our politics. Yeah. So, you know, when these conversations are being had around tables, um, dinner, dinner tables, you know, the Confederate flags and the Confederate monuments and kids are asking, what is the big to do about all of that? Well, mm -hmm. these books explain exactly why. Yes, 100%. Um, okay, let's, we have a school with us today. So let's ask yes. some questions from them. So this is from a second grader at Lafayette. Um, when did you start making art? When did I start making art? I've been making art. I often say that I, I was born with a pencil in my hand, mm -hmm. or at least it seems that way because I can't remember a day in my life when I wasn't drawing or painting or something. Um, but it's interesting because right now I'm working on writing a graphic novel about my life, like a memoir. And so I've been having all of these conversations with my mom and my mom's been sending me some of my drawings. I said, mom, can you look around and find some of my drawings that I made when I was a kid? And what I've discovered, she's been sending me drawings and she's been sending me artwork. So I was not only the kind of kid who sat around the house drawing pictures, but I was also building things and making things and making artwork that could hang on walls. And um, so, yeah, I've always kept my hands busy. So if you're, you know, it doesn't make a difference how old you are, if you're five years old, if you're eight years old, if you're drawing pictures, you're an artist. Yes, exactly. Okay, another question from Lafayette. Uh, this is from Zen in second grade. What is your favorite book that you have written? I don't have a favorite book because all of my books mean something very special to me. So for instance, the William Steele book, this is my favorite book because it is the book that is just, just now publishing this week. However, my other favorite book is Strong as Sandow because I also was a bodybuilder about, about 20 years ago. Oh. Um, Poet is my favorite book because it's the first book that I wrote and illustrated. Um, it Just Happened, which is also behind there, is my favorite book because it is the book that I first authored. Hmm. So all of these books behind me have special meanings and they're all my favorites. That makes sense. Okay, let's see. We have a question from Stephen King. Um, actually, I think this is from someone in the family. Um, how did you get your... <clears throat> Excuse me, how did you get your ideas for such amazing books? You know, I all of my books were inspired by different experiences, but I would say collectively that I listening to my friends, listening to my writer friends. It was my buddy Chris Barton, who is a writer here in Austin, who suggested I write the story about George Moses Horton. Mm -hmm. It was my friend Diana Aston who wrote the book A Rock is Lively, I think, or yeah, my friend Diane Aston, who also writes books, she suggested that I write the book, um, It Just Happened. Um, and my friends are always sending me ideas. My friend Cynthia Levinson that's in my, just recently sent me an idea for um, a story that I might consider writing. Earlier this year, my very last live in-person school visit, a fifth grade teacher walked up to me and he gave me an idea for a story that I went home and I wrote and I sold and that book will come out in another two years. So I'm constantly listening yeah. to brilliant people who inspire me, yes. A including your mom. <laughs> including my mom, yeah. Who doesn't think that she's brilliant but she doesn't know how she is inspiring me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay, we have um, another question from a student at Lafayette. The question is, what is your favorite material to make art with? Um, and again, I don't have a favorite material. Um, I am not what's called like a trademark illustrator. I don't have just one style of illustration that I that I specialize in or one medium that I specialize in. I like to let the feel of the narrative of the story dictate what direction I'll take the visuals. Um, so I've painted in oils and I've painted in pastels and I've painted in, in, um, in ink and colored pencils. But now that I'm painting digitally on this big Cintiq, I can paint in, I can paint using starbursts. You know, I can paint with grass. 
Um, I can paint with just about anything that you can imagine. So this is probably the perfect tool for me because I can do something different with every book. Yeah, that is neat. There's a lot of possibilities. Um, a question to go back to the book uh, is, where was the cemetery where the journal was hidden? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and I should know that a little bit better. I know that it's in Philadelphia and I, on the tip of my tongue, I know the word Lebanon is in the title of that cemetery. Um, yeah, so you're gonna have to Google that. It's uh, Lebanon, it's an, it was a, in, a, in a slave section of that cemetery, enslaved section of that cemetery. So yeah, yeah, I should be better prepared to answer that question, but that's okay. Because... My head is filled with all of the, <laughs> I'm usually writing and illustrating and promoting at least five books at a time. So my head was filled with all of these, this information yeah. and my head is only so big, so. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, let's see, we've got another question from, um, and Campbell students at Lafayette. This is from Ben. He says, do you have a favorite book? Not one that you've written, but have a favorite book, maybe something that's inspired you lately. Yes, and my, when I was younger, I didn't read. I was not a reader when I was a kid. I, and I, yeah, I just saw I wasn't a reader. But when I did start reading, it was in my early twenties mm -hmm. and it was a book called Black Boy by Richard Wright. Mm -hmm. And I love that book because that was the book where I first, saw myself in that book. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, English literature, they told me I have to read Greek and Roman myths. I have to read Edgar Allan Poe. I have to read The Grapes of Wrath. I have to read Greek and Roman myths. And I didn't want to read that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but when I finally saw a book with a character that looked like me, who shared my experience, who shared my history, I became a reader. And earlier this summer, I reread Black Boy and it's surprising because I was like, I totally forgot after 30 something years how much I loved that book. Yeah. But Richard right now, you know, many years later, I've read almost all of Richard Wright's books. Yeah, I mean, again, that just goes to show how important representation is. And I think that's what you're doing with your blog, The, the Black Bookshelf. The Brown Bookshelf, Brown, yes. Brown Bookshelf, sorry about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so the um, Brown Bookshelf is a blog that helps to shine a light on African American authors and illustrators writing and illustrating for young people. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. Um, we have maybe just two comments left that I wanted to read to you. Um, one okay. is from Andrea. Her comment is Curly and Meadowlark Lemon used to have us rolling on the floor with laughter. Yes, the Harlem Globetrotters were so funny. I loved going to see them, yeah. I grew up with Meadowlark Lemon and Curly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the last comment is uh, also from Stephen King and he wrote, I was Eloise Granfield granddaughter's teacher, so. Oh, really, wow, wow, yeah. excellent. Well, Eloise is a national treasure and it was such an honor to be able to do a book. Actually, I just agreed to do the book. I didn't really earn a whole lot of money on that book, but I was like, that's okay. I wanna be able to share a byline with Eloise Greenfield, so. <laughs> Absolutely, she is a powerhouse. Um, so that's all the time we have for questions, but thank you, Don, so much for answering those. And thanks for uh, Lafayette for sending in some great questions and some for other friends for sending in questions. Um, we also, we put a link in the chat again so that you can get Don's uh, two new books that he has out. And so very exciting, William Still and his Freedom Stories, as well as Swish. So you can get that in the chat. Um, thanks everyone who joined us this morning for a wonderful conversation. And um, just a note that you can keep following Children and Teens Department on social media. Our handle will be posted inside the chat there. And you can also watch past events on our Politics and Pros YouTube page. page. So thanks again, everyone for being here with us today. We really Thank appreciate you it. Thank you, Don, so much for being here and sharing these stories with us. And everyone stay safe out there and keep reading widely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.